You got palm trees blowing around you, man. Looks beautiful. <laughs> Lots of good friends. Bill's there, but I can't see his, his video. Rob. Good to see lots of folks. We are live on YouTube and Zoom. Welcome, everyone. Hey, everybody. Lots of lots of friends, new and old here. This is awesome. Uh, we've got we got something a little bit different to the end. There's some kind of a feedback on somebody's audio is on. There we go. So we've got something kind of fun today. Uh, Rick couldn't make it. He had something pop up at the last second, and and we we're going to be talking about portraits. So I started thinking about who are my friends that are the best at portraiture and I got Dan Hawk here from Dan Hawk Photography here in Portland. He's joining us. He's going to be sort of guest co-hosting with me and taking questions from you guys about portraiture. I'm going to talk a little bit about how I've done portraiture uh, in my travel photography in the past and, and sort of some things I've learned for myself doing portrait work and then Dan's going to talk a little bit about portrait work and then we're going to take a bunch of your questions. Um, everybody's muted by default just so that all of this talking at once doesn't drown out the, uh, the content. And uh, I don't know, Woody, do you have any uh, announcements to put out? Uh, not really, just the, the standard um, welcome, everyone. And we're still letting people in here. We're streaming on YouTube and on Zoom. If you ever want to sign up, HudsonHenry.com slash office hours. We do this every couple of weeks and uh, we rotate. We, we take questions. We take, sometimes we do image galleries and submissions. Sometimes we issue challenges and people submit the challenge results. Um, sometimes we have guests like today. So welcome, Dan. Thanks for coming. Um, Darren's helping us. He's moderating YouTube and taking questions and filtering those to us to make sure your questions get answered. Um, otherwise, it's going to be posted on YouTube afterwards also on, on Hudson's uh, YouTube page. So go there if you want to rewatch it for some reason. Uh, other than that, we hope you join in the future and uh, welcome. Yeah, welcome everybody. So, uh, Dan, are you good? I'm, I'm just planning on kind of jumping in, sharing my screen for a minute and, and talking about some of sort of, you know, my travel portraits from the past, some natural light, some artificial light, and then a few people who've inspired me over the past, and then I'll just throw it over to you. I'll try to go through pretty quick so we have plenty of time for questions. That sound good? Yep. Oh, Dan is... <laughs> Woody has the host position right now, so somehow I, I I muted myself, and unfortunately, that means I couldn't unmute myself. So. <laughs> yeah, that's locked out. So, all right. Well, I'm going to jump in, share my screen here, uh, and you know, I think I'm probably more well known for landscapes in this crowd, but for a long time, I did travel photography, and I wrote, you know wrote articles, put the images with the articles, did you know tons of tons of that kind of stuff along with some stock photography. And it, along the way, when you're, when you're doing stories like that, people are always a huge part of your stories. And I saw there were a lot of questions about natural light versus artificial light and one light setups and things like that. So I thought I'd run through and, and talk about sort of, you know, how I view portrait photography. And I'll just go full screen here. You know, I am always looking for contrast when I'm, when I'm photographing people. And I, I think of, you know, Photographing people, I break portraits down into kind of two categories. There's that headshot where it's just really all about the person's face and expression. This is an orphan in, in Zanzibar. I was doing a little work for the, uh, for the Orphan Foundation in, in Tanzania um, several years back. And, um, you know, this is more of a headshot where it's really all about the person and the backdrop is just, you know, muted and out of focus. And we're really just doing that headshot to get a portrait of the person. Uh, through the eyes. And then there's the environmental portrait. This is my good friend, Jeremy, who's this huge bike aficionado. He has like 20 bikes in his house and he, he lives to go out on adventures, but he's always working at the same time. He's this, he's this director with uh, DaVita these days, you know, for operations for them and manages facilities doing, doing um, dialysis worldwide. So it's kind of fun to, you know, I'm always trying to tell kind of a story about a person. This guy is always out adventuring, but he's also kind of always linked in doing his business work. And so, you know, finding a way to kind of tell a story about place and person. This is my cousin Rio who loves adventuring. And these are all natural light photos. So, you know, one, one way to work in natural light is 
just the same way you would in the landscape. You're looking for those interesting angles of light. Here's some sort of, you know, side light, long shadows, late afternoon in Death Valley at the racetrack. Um, evening light, this is a pro rider for shin kite boards. Um, you know, ways to tell a story about a person. You know, if, if you're out in harsh, harsh conditions, this is the middle of the day in Tanzania. This is more work for that, for that orphan foundation. And this woman is the headmistress at a school for orphans in the hills above Arusha. And the, the conditions were so harsh and there were no windows in the schoolroom. So I just had them all pose in the door on the shady side of the building so that it's kind of an open shade, but that light from the middle of the day harsh African sun is bouncing up off the red dirt into their faces, lighting them. And there's contrast with that darkness in the background. And I'm always looking for that contrast. Here's another doorway in another orphanage in Zanzibar. Um, and and you know, they're in the doorway, bright, sunny day. You can see it's the doorway reflected in their eyes here. And I'm just using that, that open shade. You know, here you can actually see me. This is that same doorway at the school with the headmistress, just one of the kids close up. Uh, you can actually see me crouch down taking the photo there. It's a harsh middle of the day, noon light, hard shadows. Um, so if you don't have external lights, this was, this was shooting a, a court case, a Voting Rights Act case uh, in the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, kind of combining my law background with my photography. This was a, a voting rights case out of Montana being heard in the Portland's old Piner Courthouse. And this is just kind of an example of a setup, how you can use window light, particularly if you've got some, some soft draperies like this, or if there's not direct light coming in through the window, but the, but the bright outside day is bouncing that window light in through, the way it lays the light out on your subjects can just be magical. In a darkened room, you know, that, that diffuse light coming through the window, windows are a wonderful way to do portrait. You're in a darkened room, turn off the the interior lights and just let that window light come through and light your subject. Um, you know, here's a, I love environmental portraits. This is the guy who flew me into the Arctic when I did a traverse of the Brooks Range in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge um, with his plane. Just a great guy, you know, and as, it, I just, as he was getting us all out, I was like, oh, I gotta take your picture, man. You're part of my story. Um, so trying to kind of get that, he was like this Indiana Jones-like character my friend Billy, when we were climbing Denali, I was uh, photographing a, a documentary and filming a documentary, uh, climbing Denali with the first African-American team to take on Denali. And I just love getting people in the landscape. This is when I was first dating my wife, Stacy, and we were in the Caribbean and just, you know, we didn't have that boat. <laughs> we actually rode to this beach on scooters that we rented. This is in uh, Cozumel. But you know, just just finding those photos of people that say something about them. This is my friend Babu in Zanzibar, and you know, another thing. This is another bright, sunny, high noon day, no external lights to work with, but in a tight city uh, street with tall buildings. This is in Stone Town in Zanzibar. You can be out in open shade, and the light's so even and so nice that it's, it's almost like having a softbox. It's reflecting off the upper parts of the building and bouncing down diffuse into the shadows of the canyon. Canyons, if you're out in the wild outdoors, can do the same thing for you. You know, here's another situation like that uh, in Michoacan for, for, for Dia de Muertos, the Day of the Dead, where it's under kind of a tented pavilion. It's like people are selling arts and crafts and all dressed up for Day of the Dead, walking through. And, the middle of the day but that harsh light is diffuse under that tent in open shade um, you know you're just always looking for interesting light and contrast this is more day of the dead stuff at night with you know the city and obviously you know working with a longer lens to blur the background and bring your subject out using focus as a way to pull the eye to what's important in the scene um, you know, natural light can work even, one of the things too that I'd say before we jump into to, to integrating some light into your photography, and I'd let Dan talk more about that than I, than I am because he's more a master of it. But, you know, our sensors are so good now. This is when I was first shooting with the D800 up on Denali that even in harsh light, you know, if you shoot to protect your highlights, you're still gonna be able to pull shadows out with some work. Now this is on a, I was actually shooting a training course and I was out kiteboarding with my friend, John. So he's all totally windblown, but I wanted to talk about using light and photography. And I just had a single strobe with an umbrella on a light stand. And this is 
a shot under a bridge where we go kiteboarding with no light whatsoever, just open shade. And it's not bad. I could probably edit this image to make him really stand out. I don't like the little grasses that are distracting me in the background here, but it's kind of my setup shot. And then I put that little bit of light on him and leave the background a bit underexposed and just bring in enough light to expose his face the way I want. So he stands out from the background. So not only focus, but now he's more brightly lit than the background. You know, I'm flashing in just a lick of light that's lighting him more than the background is lit at that exposure. And then just shifting my position to get, you know, no distractions behind him and doing a little editing with that lit photo. You can just do so much even with a single light. Um, you know, if you get the background exposure. Here's another example. I was doing a photo uh, shoot for the LA Times on the big Koalina Resort development uh, on the island of Oahu. And this is the Disney Alani. They were doing storytelling hour for the children out at this big fire pit near the beach. And they had these amazing Hawaiian storytellers. And this is the night I went out there without any flash and I'm shooting and I'm like, oh, the shadows are so harsh with that firelight lighting the face. And this is my wife, Stacy here in the background. So the next night I went out there, it was a different storyteller, but I had her sit over here with a strobe and I talked to the storyteller beforehand to let him know what was gonna be happening. And I had the strobe remote firing. And so I exposed for the shadows on one side, but I had her fill or I exposed for the fire. And then I had her just kind of fill those shadows a little bit with flash so that they weren't as harsh and just blew in a little light from the side with her sitting over in the corner, remote controlling it from the camera. You know, having, having I'm not a big fan of, of bringing strobe light in or light in direct the same angle as the camera, like an on-camera flash, because that tends to, to not create interesting shadows. It's just kind of a flat, direct light. You see that all the time with point and shoot cameras with flashes or with your cell phone with flash. I love to bring light in from the side. This is my friend Babu's wife, Mariam in Zanzibar at Blue Hour. And I, I just had my, my friend Charles hold the flash up high. He's pretty tall and angle it down um, from the right to just create a little light as if there were a, a wind, uh, like there were a skylight up above her to the right just dropping a little bit of light in and underexposed the background about a stop and a half. And I gelled the flash with a little bit of orange gel and set the camera in tungsten mode, which adds blue. So it was kind of a blue white balance with an orange gelled flash so that when he corrected, it adds even a little more blue to that blue or background. There's all kinds of things you can do with lighting. You know, this is, this one is an example of a, a little project I did. I, I took a course on environmental portraiture at, uh, the Northwest, um, oh, the Northwest Art, uh, PNCC, Pacific Northwest College of Art. And, um, and this guy is kind of the king of the clown posse or used to be in the Alberta Arts District of Portland. They were this, this group of rowdy clowns who worked security at wild events. And his name's Dingo Dismal. And he built this, this trailer for his bike out of duct tape and cardboard. <laughs> it was just this crazy character. And I actually put a flash inside the trailer with him at dusk and then lit this thing in the park where he had it parked from, from the other side. So a couple of flashes. I believe that was his house Hudson, Here's, for a while. What, did he live in it for a while? So. Yeah. He was living somewhere else for a while when, but when the I- the clown house, it. but- yeah, 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 he was living in the clown house, but he did live sometimes, sometimes in this thing. <laughs> And then uh, this is in, in the Usabara Mountains, which kind of stretch to the, uh, to the east towards the ocean from Kilimanjaro. It's this beautiful range in Tanzania. And there's no way to capture this image of this farmer that, that I met up on this ridge line, just behind his little hut by his maize field here. Um, there's no way to capture this image without a little off-camera flash. You know, this is a single strobe, gelled orange to match the light at sunset. Uh, again, my friend Charles just holding it off to the side with me kind of directing where to put it and just throwing a little light in on them because, you know, the lights behind them, the natural light is all from the sun back there. Again, underexposing a couple of stops. So, you know, a single strobe can do a lot for you. But, you know, to, to wrap up the pictures that I've done in travel photography, this is a shot of Matt Kleskowski up in Steens Mountain. You know, our modern sensors are so darned amazing. This is no artificial light whatsoever. We can we can shoot to protect our highlights these days and still bring so much shadow detail 
back in, it just blows my mind. You know, it would be completely unthinkable in the days of film and unthinkable in the early days of digital. And these backlit sensors, particularly, you know, I've been using the Sony backlit sensors, both in Sony cameras and Nikon cameras, uh, since the Nikon D800 came out with one, and they're just incredible, the dynamic range that you're able to capture. This is just a little cloud passing over the sun on a beautiful day at Mount Hood, cross-country skiing with my family, and, you know, just that open shade, that light, and yet the highlights on Mount Hood aren't blown out. Um, just, you know, it's, it's magical what we can do these days. I did so much work in this one. I looked at the back of the camera, this is a very bright orange sunset on the coast with Terrible Tilly, the, the lighthouse out there off Cannon Beach, um, just a black rock out there. And, and my friend just black in the frame, you know, you couldn't see any detail in Steve's face and then come back and, and paint in some shadow detail in post-production and it's just amazing what these sensors can capture. So um, that's basically, my little presentation on images from my past. I would just say that, that one thing to do if you wanna get better uh, at, at any type of photography, but it, it may be portrait photography in particular is look at people who inspire you, you know, go through books of photos on, on whatever you're after. So with portrait photography, um, I love the environmental portraiture of Arnold Newman. I think this photo of Stravinsky with his piano is just this amazing piece of modern art combined in a great portrait you would it breaks so many rules and yet it's this beautiful piece of modern art you know here's here's Woody Allen and uh, JFK just you know amazing scenes of, of iconic people um, and the way he captures something at their core you just get a feel for them through the background the expression the time he spent with them here's a couple of famous photos and you know you can see he's using a convention here this is clearly something Arnold Newman did for maybe people that that were uncomfortable being photographed will put your put your hand up on your head you know you can see that that you know there's techniques people use and you can tell that with this with this shot of uh of, of Picasso that that's just a window light lighting him. he's got a beautiful ruffled background back there Another person that I love the portraits of and he's not known for portraits is Sebastian Salgado he's one of my favorite photographers that's alive today. Um, he does spectacular storytelling photography that if you look at, he got famous photographing the plight of the mine workers back in the days of film in Brazil and the pit mines and strip mines. Um, and he's done a lot of work photographing sort of the last people who live uh, traditional ways of life around the world and the last species out there that are kind of untouched by man in the Arctic or deep in the Amazon. But he did his photo series uh, on Kuwait and the Iraq war that, that I was in as an enlisted young person back in, in 1990, 91. Um, he, he realized you know, Saddam had lit all these oil wells on fire uh, as he withdrew forces. And he knew that the Texan hell fighters, the firefighters who put out oil wells were gonna be in demand to put those out. So he basically got permission to go in with them and photograph that process. And I think the storytelling and environmental portraiture of you know, both the Iraqi people and how this environmental catastrophe affected them and the guys who went in to do that is just mind-bendingly amazing. You know, it just inspires me. <laughs> it's just incredible, isn't it? I mean, you look at that and you get a window into someone's life that you would never would have quite imagined what it might look like otherwise. I think that's kind of the power of portrait photography is and he, he applies that when he works with the natural world. I think that's one of the things about his photos of animals that just blows my mind is that they are environmental portraits of the life of these, of these creatures out there. So I think there's so much to do with portraiture. I got to get out of this. Uh, there we go. Couldn't get my mouse back in that presentation. But there's so much to do with portraiture that can expand your storytelling. Even if you think of yourself as a macro photographer or a landscape photographer, if you really want to be a storytelling photographer and connect and tell stories visually, I think putting people in your landscapes from time to time, putting people in your imagery, you know, telling stories of people connects with other people in a really powerful way.
So Dan, I'll let you jump in and, and give a presentation and then we can do, uh, we can do some Q and A. I think we probably do Q and A for hours on this, but. Yeah, it's, it's definitely a, uh, a fairly deep subject. Uh, and there's, I think one of the things that's interesting looking at the work that you've presented there that you've showed both yours and these other, other great photographers is that there's so many different ways to interpret the idea of portraits or the idea, you know, environmental versus studio versus headshots. There's, I mean, there's so much to it. Um, I'll go ahead and share my screen. Let me pick um, one of them. I got to move my screen around here to get it to do what it's supposed to do. There we go. Oh, that's fun. So, um, yeah. So you guys mentioned a little bit about what I do. So I am, uh, I would call myself a, uh, a portrait outdoor lifestyle photographer. And so I, um, you know, I think we have a lot in common in terms of, you know, I'm, I'm a landscape photographer. I love getting out in the middle of nowhere. There's a lot of stuff in my portfolio that is, there's no people, you know, it's, it, these are, you know, maybe you can call it a portrait of the landscape, but it's, uh, I love the landscape stuff. That's a, a, in large part, how I keep sane. Um, and so a lot of that, I have a lot of that background and that's actually kind of how I got into photography seriously this time around in life. I've been a photographer of some sorts for my whole life, pretty much. Uh, I was just looking at a picture of myself with a little 110 film camera here a couple of weeks ago. It's one of those Fisher Price plastic ones. Um, Fisher Price and Kodak made it together. So I was taking pictures with those when I was a little kid. Uh, I'm 45 now. So um, that was all on film. And then um, as I got back into photography, I started with landscape and then I started moving into portraiture largely as an answer to what am I going to do in my post banking career uh, life? And so I was working in banking. I really hadn't done a lot of portrait work, uh, nothing that was intentional and, but knew I wanted to make a living at photography and I was working primarily with wealthier clients, um, doing uh, wealth management and investment banking. So I went out and I learned how to shoot headshots. And to do that, I had to light them and I needed to put them on a backdrop and I had to put white paper backdrop behind them. So that's, that's kind of how I got into this. Um, what I'll do is I'll walk you through a little bit of my portfolio, just so you kind of know what I do. So first I'll, I'm gonna show you the headshots just so you can kind of see that headshots are one of those things that when you see this you go oh yeah that's portrait um so um here's one of those white backdrop portraits that was one kind of what i first got started with and there's a few of those in here and those are pretty straightforward um and then some of these are you know things that i've produced over the years but basically i guess what i kind of wanted to get at is I really feel like lighting can be natural. It can be artificial. And, and the main goal for me as a photographer is to figure out what needs to happen to best serve the situation. So these are pretty much all lit for the most, you know, for the most part. Every once in a while, one will sneak in here that's, that's all natural light. But when I'm doing headshot uh, portraits, I almost always light them. And a lot of that is because then I'm not leaving anything to chance. Um, but sometimes you get lucky. This is natural light outside, really great natural light. This one's natural light as well. Um, this one is actually natural light, but it's inside of a building. It's um, renovation hardware actually, um, which if you've ever been in one of those places, it's, there's so many lights, you, you, you kind of, it's almost like having unnatural uh, artificial lighting. Um, so I wanna move on to a, some different things and show you a little bit more. Um, this is a, a portfolio of my work that is primarily what I would call dramatic portraits. Uh, and so I'm going to, and I'll tell you a little bit about kind of how I, how I do these. So my paid work is primarily working with people to either do portraits like this uh, this this is a woman who is a local um, cartoonist illustrator based here in Portland, and she wrote she made a comic book 
uh, with these demons that represent the demons that are always telling her about how she's not good enough and how she's not talented enough. She happened to have a giant duffel bag full of them. And I just said, we probably need to put those in a bathtub with you. And so, <laughs> I love that which, is, which is pretty fun. Um, her name's Lucy Bellwood. Um, and one of the things we did in this shot, uh, there's only a single light that I used in here. Uh, there's a, it's just a big uh, strobe, like a 600 watt strobe inside of a big softbox. It is kind of over, um, you can kind of see the reflection here but it's right over kind of right behind the camera. Uh, and the one other interesting piece of this one is that the, the, um, the tub is actually pink in this shot and I Photoshopped it and made it white so that it would match the tile and the, the, the subway tile and the floor. But yeah, big soft box, which is you're gonna see is a very common thing for me. Uh, big soft box, double diffused so that it, it kind of mimics a bright window light. And so I'll just scroll through here. This is one that is all natural, no lighting taken out in the Alvord Desert out in Eastern Oregon. Uh, a, a beautiful dancer that I just met out there, a little caravan of people that were camping together. In this case, I threw on my 70200 and just and just started snapping away. The the light was actually being diffused by a dust storm, mm -hmm. which is kind of cool because you think normally you'd need you'd need some big softbox or some kind of big giant diffuser to keep the harsh midday light from from blowing out all the all of the bright spots. But in this case, the sandstorm did it. Hey Dan. That's a really yeah. You. That's a question. Yeah. How much of your portraiture, like the not studio, not headshot stuff, this kind of stuff? Yeah. Do you find um, in the moment or meet the people at the scene and just decide to take a photo that day or that minute versus going out with a plan? Yeah, so, okay, so I'll, I'll start with this one. Lucy is a person that I had, I actually backed her Kickstarter and I reached out and said, hey, I would love to, I, I was actually starting a portrait project that year to learn how to do this kind of editorial style portrait better. And so I reached out and just said, I'd love to make this portrait and I didn't have this specific idea in mind, but I just said, I want to shoot you with the characters from your book. Is there a way for us to do that? And I was kind of thinking maybe she would illustrate them over the top of the photo when we were done. And she just said, I actually happen to have a big duffel bag full of these. So that's how we did that one. So I reached out to her. This one is a random, her, um, Bijou Becca. You can look her up on the internet. She is uh, does aerial um, and silk uh, work and worked with uh, the AWOL Collective here in Portland for a while. I met them just at random. I drove up to them. This is just last spring. So I had a mask on, I had goggles on because it was a sandstorm. So that was totally impromptu, serendipitous. Um, this is my, oh, this is a, a beautiful place, by the way. It's like- Oh, it totally, yeah. Um, this is another, um, a friend of a friend that I met who is a graphic designer that worked for Adobe and is also a prolific musician. And I reached out um, and said, hey, I'd love to make a portrait of you with you drawing, doing some graphic arts in front of all of your Adobe applications and playing guitar. So somebody I reached out to, to create something for my portfolio. Um, this one's actually lit with three lights. You can see the reflection here off of one of the big soft boxes. Um, there's actually a light down on the ground underneath here, which you can kind of see here. And this one's totally gritty. And I kind of did that on purpose. I just wanted that look. So we, we, we actually lit this one not too bright, um, but we did enough so that it could be, um, I wanted it to be gritty. I wanted it to be a little bit dark and have to pull everything up in post. Um, this is client work. Um, this is actually as much as you'd think, oh yeah, there's a white background. This is actually against a window, uh, mm -hmm. all natural light on this one, which I think did some really cool stuff with her skin tones. Um, she's a, a, a young high school kid who was uh, creating a website for herself as a music teacher. Um, this is a client who I actually had worked with before. He's a chef as well. And then um, he wanted to create some more work for, um, for his music website. He's a, a drummer. And this one is shot with, um, this is called Rear Curtain Sync which I don't know if you guys have, have used. When you're using uh, strobes or speed lights, you can tell your camera to, 
to pop the flash at the end of the long exposure instead of at the beginning. And in this case, what I did is I actually popped the flash three times during the exposure. Very cool. Yeah, kind of fun. It was it was an interesting uh, experiment. So how do you know how long was that exposure? Um, this one is about four seconds. Uh-huh. Yeah, and Very I cool. told him, I said, I want you to move across the bongos. Awesome. Yeah. This is um, one of my oldest friends from college. Um, she is a therapist and just wanted a new headshot. And so if you look at the books, it's just a whole bunch of psychology books. <laughs> this was that. taken This was taken in her living room. Um, and this was just with a single uh, a large strobe with a big 32 inch softbox, double, double uh, uh, diffused. You ask her, you ask her how that made her feel? <laughs> yeah, I, <laughs> we, we hung out for a long time shooting this. It was fun. So I was just going to say, you said she wanted a headshot and I think you gave her the most amazing environmental portrait, really. Yeah, it's, exactly. It's like, so great. So, so, and that's, a, you know, that's a great, that's a great, I'm glad you brought that up. So in the world of photography, especially portraits, uh, there are, there are people who are famous for headshots, you know, like Peter Hurley uh, has this headshot crew where he has a very specific method that he teaches. And, and I, I think it's great. I mean, I, I've watched some of his tutorials to figure out how he, how he thinks about light and how he thinks about the directionality of light. One of the things that, that I've found is that wh- while I can do headshots and I do them all the time for, for people, you know, I mean, a lot of times I'll go into a business and we'll shoot 30 or 40 different people in a day. What is interesting is for a lot of people, a, an environmental portrait, environmental portrait like this is actually more, more useful in a lot of ways because they can use it in different ways. Right. This is, we have versions of this without her finger pointing that she's using for LinkedIn, that sort of thing. Sure. But, but this one, it made it, it made it feel like you're in her office, it makes you feel like you're, you're maybe on the couch across from her, that sort of thing. And that she's and fun. Exactly, exactly. And I think that's a big, that's a big piece of environmental portraits. So this is another one here. This, um, her name's Amy and she's a professional organizer. And we did a whole branding shoot for her business, which was, I think I was there for five hours. Uh, she had her husband there. She had her dogs there. She had a client, an older woman come over who was one of her clients that they did some pretend organizing f- for the shoot. But this is the headshot she actually uses on her website now. And it's, it's cropped in for the, for, the, for the headshot portion. But the idea here was, hey, we're gonna have a conversation. Uh, this is another one. Uh, and just so you know, this is same big single softbox on one side. Although I saw somebody ask about hair light in the comments yeah. Um, yeah. On, on, th- th- that you shared with me. And in this one, there actually is a light that you can kind of see is bringing out a little bit of these, these flyaway hairs on this side. And that light is kind of over on this, you know, kind of in this back area behind here coming, shooting back at her. And it's probably at like a, like a 64th power. It's a speed light. Right. And that's, it wasn't to do much. It was just to give a little bit more depth to the room here and to make the separation between the, the white background and the outside of, um, of the window make pop a little bit more. These it's, ones. It's hard, the hard thing I'll just say for people that are, that are new to lighting is that you're, you're really most of the time going for a look that no one would ever know that you lit it. Right. right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Um, and, and so sometimes, sometimes like this one, very harsh light, right? It's, I shouldn't say very harsh. It's really powerful light. And though it's really soft and, and is really flattering to her skin, mm-hmm. what it, you can see this deep shadow, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and just, I loved the way that the, the light worked with her skin tone here. And we put it right up against the wall there to get this really dark shadow. I really like that the shadow takes the spot of like a backlight. Yeah. Um, normally you would highlight somebody with a rim light or something behind here. And that doesn't, you know, yeah, that exactly. Would, that is the same effect though. Yeah. Here's another therapist, uh, client work, went out and met her in her office. 
this one is another one that um, this is lit. And just so you, I talked about using a big strobe, this one is actually shot using a very, very small softbox, like a 12 inch softbox and a speed light because mm -hmm. I needed to be super mobile. And this is shot right outside of the OHSU building down on South Waterfront in Portland. Um, yeah. And no hair light here because we've got this, we've got this great background doing all this, all this cool stuff. And we just had a single light on the front and you can see the, one of the good indicators when you're looking at portraits, look in the person's eye. And a lot of times you can see that's called a catch light and the catch light will indicate to you where the light is. You can see, yeah, the shadows and the catch lights in the eyes. You can tell how many lights got used, yep. where they were. Yeah. On that yeah. note, guys, uh, there was a question in YouTube that just brought that same thing up is what's the best way to avoid reflections in like a glasses situation? So you have that catch light. I mean, you don't yeah. want glasses though, right? Yeah. So let me, um, I'm going to jump. Well, I'm going to, let me, I'm going to come to that in a second. I'll remember it. If I don't remember it, when we go to the, I'll show you some more headshot, um, portraits and I want you to remind me of it. I want to show you a couple more in this one. This is one of my favorite uh, portraits. This is a Bertone. He's a winemaker out in North Plains, kind of over in the Hillsborough area. Uh, this is a single light. We did all this with one light in, the, in his, uh, in his um, tasting room. Beautiful. And, and so just big, huge softbox. I think this is probably like a, like a six foot softbox, really big one with like a 400 watt strobe. So everybody sees what, what Dan was talking about earlier. You can see in the upper right part of his eye that that softbox is above and to the right. Also the shadow yep. on the left, on the side of his yeah. face, you can tell which side's lit and which isn't. Exactly. Um, this one is um, a, a, a person that I met here in Portland. I was actually hiking um, and I met uh, Brooke and found out that she was a personal trainer and uh, just went over and did a, a session with her in the gym uh, we, tur we, we turned all the lights down really low. And so we get this really gritty, uh, it's called Ironside is the gym. And, and we got this really gritty look in this building. And this is also another, once again, single strobe in a big giant softbox. Cool. That one I told you guys is natural light. Mm -hmm. This is a shoot I did for a local credit union. No lighting here. This is all natural. Mm. Overcast. natural here on this one mm -hmm. and you can see there's not really a catch light you can only kind of see this is the sun sky, just the cloudy yeah. sky mm -hmm. and then this one here uh this mm -hmm. is an author portrait for Pender penguin random house she's a science fiction writer no catch light here but just a crazy wild background this is in pioneer courthouse square in the mall and this is Lucy once again, the with with her uh, with the demons, telling them how it is. <laughs> fun. And this one, we we actually were using a, a softbox above her head, so you can kind of see the shadows here under her nose, and it's because I wanted them all lit up evenly, like they were in a classroom with fluorescent lights overhead. Sure. That sort of look. Here's one that's natural light. Another one that's natural light. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, this one, while it looks lit, is all natural. It's just a lot of post-processing to get this one right. Overcast days. Yep, overcast days and a, a lot of dodging and burning to get everything just right. And I also had to move the dog. Uh, he was a little <laughs> further away. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. Um, we had, we had a really good question uh, from Tony about, are you using a tripod or handheld mostly when you do this stuff? You know, it kind of depends. I mean, like picking through like handheld, handheld. I, most of my, I would say that most of these environmental portraits are all handheld. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm going to jump back over to the headshots to answer that question um, about avoiding reflections. So if you look through here, this is a studio shot where I mean, which means I probably have, I think I have three lights going off here and yet there is no reflection on her glasses. Nope. Uh, there's a little tiny bit right here. You can see just a little tiny bit. And what I would, what I'll say is that I think that it makes the most sense to work with positioning 
Um, sorry, I got I have the wrong thing in my way here. I had to move the all of your beautiful faces out of the way so I can get to the controls. Um, this is this is one that's lit, and we have window light. And so one of the things that's really key is to think about. I mean, you all think about this when you're when you're shooting you know, waterfalls or you're shooting a reflection on a lake, you got to think about what direction the light's coming from in order to avoid those reflections. And so what I do is if I walk into a room and I've got somebody who comes in to get their portrait taken and they have glasses, I have them face 45 degrees away from the light. And so that might mean that I need to put a reflector on the opposite side to, to kind of fill in the shadows, or it might need, might mean that I need a different light at a different angle um, to fill in. But a lot of times I go in and I have the lights all set up. I can't just move the, we're talking about a big giant softbox with a big strobe that might be plugged in. I can't yeah. just move it. So sometimes I have to move the person. And so what I would say is you kind of need to think about it a little bit like you would just be practical about it. You got to get that person to get their glasses offset. So they're not looking straight into the light. The light. Is it one yeah, thing? Can you still you tilt glasses them? up? You like tilt the glasses forward a little bit, put the you, holes up a little bit. You can, but one of the things that's been a little tricky is that all, almost all modern glasses have some kind of an anti-glare coating on them, yep. and it's usually kind of blue or green. And what happens is, if you tilt it, oftentimes you get more of the color and less of the reflection. Um, so there's the one of the polarizers don't really work on, on eyeglasses really yeah. yeah i i have at least i have found they don't work um because the color is is there's like a coating on you don't know if you guys have if you have a high-end you know nice lens for your camera a lot of times they have those greenish or blue uh uh front pieces on the lenses and it looks you know reflects kind of a blue or a or a, or a green color and that's just the coating that they put on the front of it. And you, you putting on, putting on yeah. a, um, you're not going to get rid of that with a polarizer. So the, if I ever absolutely can't get around it, I have a couple little tricks for getting rid of reflections. You can zoom in really close in Lightroom. And if you create a localized adjustment over just the area on the glasses, that's the wrong tint. So if you get like a purple tint, on the glasses, you can go in there and you can actually change the tint, pull it back more green and maybe um, use the dehaze slider as well. The dehaze will cut through the, the hazing and then the tint will change the tint and kind of correct it back towards the color it should be, which is Brutal, a weird, weird little trick that I learned kind of to fix my own mistakes. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Um, let me move. One of the things that, um, I have been working with lately, um, and this is a piece of something that I'm trying to do for myself. I've been trying to move towards doing more um, environmental portraits out in nature. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the areas that I'm hoping to grow my business uh, in this next year. I had intended to start last year, but I, I really am I'm kind of tackling that this year. Um, and Hudson, you picked one of, when you shared it on Instagram, you picked this photo. Mm -hmm. um, to, to share, this is a friend of mine, Keith, who actually hired me to take these, these portraits of him out on the Oregon coast. And I did a little video segment for him as well. That was him, he's an Olympus shooter. And this is their, their newest telephoto lens. They, he got a copy of it before they released it. And so we went out and did a bunch of uh, branding work for him that he could use to, to promote his work with Olympus, to use as his profile photo, and for them to use on all their social channels. And so that, this is some of the work that I've been trying to do more of. Love it. Yep. This is a couple that I actually met out hiking at uh, Tamawanas Falls up near Mount Hood. And mm -hmm. one of the things that was, that's kind of interesting is that here's an actual portrait of them <laughs> that, I, that, that I took. This is all natural light. And so one of the things that I feel like is really important when you're shooting nature is to realize that oftentimes you're going to have, your backgrounds are going to blow out if you get the foreground, if you get the faces right. Yep. So in this case, the photo is way darker in the foreground and on their faces. And then I had to correct it to get that, to make sure that this area back here didn't blow out too much. 
it's already right on the edge of of of, of being a little too a little overexposed. Mm-hmm. But that's one of the things that you kind of have to think about. Um, you can see here it's a little darker. Um, this one is one of my favorites. I actually just licensed this to 1859 Oregon for their re- most recent issue. This is a friend of mine that I was actually out on a, a photography trip with. Um, her name's Sarah. Um, and she basically got this fire lit when like four dudes had failed miserably, <laughs> which was pretty, right. pretty awesome. Right. Yeah. She's one of the most badass. uh, outdoors people I know and she's actually prepping right now for her attempt at Mount McKinley um, oh, cool. coming up in a couple months and she she did Rainier last year and is just really really awesome and I the thing I love most about this is and, th- and maybe this is a good a good story a good way for you to think about things as you're thinking about portraits this is shot at like ISO 6400 it is not sharp by any mm-hmm. stretch, right? Mm-hmm. Like if anything, maybe we're in focus over here, but her face is not sharp. And yet I licensed this to a magazine and it's because yeah. it captures the way it feels to be there. And there's of course no natural light here. This is just, we're using fire, right? <laughs> it's what it is. You, you can't, you, sometimes you have to go with what you've got. Yep. And so I feel like a lot of times these portraits uh, some of the most meaningful portraits are are spontaneous. It's not something that you planned. It's something that you happen to be at the right time and you, and you know your camera well enough that you can kind of pull it pull it together. Does that make sense? Right. Yeah. Um, this one, I don't know, you can barely call it a portrait, but this is one of my absolute best friends. We've been friends for, gosh, 25 years. And I just snapped a picture of him at Crater Lake while he was off looking off in the distance. <laughs> Environmental portrait, I, that's what I'd call it. Here's a portrait of a van. <laughs> oh, word. Yeah. Um, here's a, kind of a fun one. Um, and I, I could plug, I know, uh, Hudson, you work with Loom Cube. This is a Loom Cube shot here. Nice. This is my friend Minaz. Uh, we were on a, a trip. This is the Southern Oregon coast. We'll pitch another thing. You got a, you're, you're doing a workshop down here pretty soon. Beaker Beach right there. Yeah. 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 And, and what I did is he was walking up the hill and I just said, Hey man, I'd like to take a portrait of you here. And so I used, it was, this was actually a gen one loom cube. The one that has, you could just push the button to flash it. Yep. And so I just had him uh, walk up the trail towards me and we just popped the flash at him. Um, And I think it's a 10 second exposure otherwise, but this is a single shot. That's awesome. It almost looks like rear curtain sink kind of thing. happened. It kind of does. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and this is one that is um, also got licensed. I want to say Travel Oregon. It was tra- either Travel Oregon or um, 1859, but they licensed it. And these are random women I met hiking on a trail up in the Mount Hood area. <laughs> and and this is one, this is one where I'll, I'll give you a little piece of advice. When you are taking portraits of groups of people. In fact, this answers somebody's question from the YouTube, from the uh, uh, spreadsheet that you sent over. Groups of people. I have a a rule for myself that I follow. And it's it's almost like writing sentences when you're in grade school and you get in trouble. And it's that I will stop down when I'm shooting groups of people. Um, You cannot shoot a group like this at F28. It just doesn't work because she'll be in focus, but she won't. And so in this case, I, I can't tell you the aperture, but it looks like it's probably like F8 at least. Yeah, you really do need to stop down when you're shooting groups or else you're gonna wind up really unhappy when you get back to edit and you realize people in the back's eyes are way out of focus and the people in the front are sharp, yeah. Exactly, and, and, and I learned- That person in the middle a little bit too, you know? Yeah, yeah. Well, and I basically learned that because I made the mistake enough times of getting groups of people together and, and not thinking about depth of field. Um, you know, I think oftentimes as, as a landscape photographer, I'm, I'm, Hey, I'm always at F8, you know, I mean, that's not always, but I'm all, almost all the time at F8. I could probably go into the field with an F8 lens and be good to go. But Hey, Dan, we're, we're down to like 10 minutes and we should probably yeah, get yeah. some questions in. This has been so let's, awesome. Let's do it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and one I just saw, you know, when someone was asking what you mean by 
licensing an image to a magazine. Well, you know, as yes. a photographer, when you create something, it's your copyrighted material. And so you, a magazine or a newspaper or anyone who wants to use it needs to buy a license from you to use that image. So that's what- Exactly. And a license. license, isn't a license typically for a single use? So like they can use it for the magazine, but maybe not uh, for a promotional material or something. Right, right. Yeah, uh, the way I, so licensing is is really, simply connected to the idea that I own the copyright. And so nobody can use it without my permission. And when they use it, I charge them money for it. And so 1859, they didn't pay me a lot of money for those. They, they licensed two images and they appeared little tiny rinky dink pictures in one of their articles on visiting Mount Hood. Right. Right. But then I shot a, um, I did a, a commercial real estate shoot this weekend and that one, the licensing is $1,200 because there's three different entities that are all using the images. So they, one's the architect, one is the designer, and one is the fabricator of some of the fixtures. So I would encourage you to think about anytime you're taking pictures for somebody else, or anytime anybody wants to use your image that you, that you look up the idea of licensing and think about, yeah, I'm happy to let you use it. You just have to pay me for it. And yeah. As, as the lawyer photographer here, I, I, you need to read those contracts that, that mm -hmm. bigger organizations send you. I just licensed something to National Geographic for a friend of mine that was on Denali that wrote an article for them and they wanted some of my images. And, you know, when I read their, when I read their terms, it was ridiculous. It's like they own the rights to your image to use and resell in perpetuity. And I, I you know, I contacted him back and said, no, I'm not going to do that for the money you're offering me. Right. Um, you know, I will, I will scratch that out and rewrite for the purpose of this article online and in print. And they're like, okay, you know, I mean, people, they, they, they try to grab as much as possible. Some of these bigger right. organizations, fortunately. Yeah. Uh, so so you, if you kind of, you if you can kind of piece it together uh, and figure out what makes sense for you, I think that's the way to approach it. Yep. What other Someone questions you got? You use releases too. And I'm sure that you do. I, yeah, I do occasionally. Um, I'm not great about remembering to do it in the field. Um, and so one of the things that's interesting is that a lot of times this is a hashtag that I have kind of monopolized on Instagram. Um, portrait of adventure. I tag my, my, whenever I take pictures of people out in the wild, I usually will tag them with this. And so uh -huh. this one got, this one got a, um, I had him sign a release, release, release. A really good friend, but she signed a release, <laughs> released, released. Almost all of these, I have them sign a release up front. Um, if they're hiring me, like my friend Keith hired me to shoot these of him, well, there's not a release needed for that because I own the image and he hired me to be part of it, um, you know, to, to take the pictures, um, that sort of thing. Hey, Dan. Right. Yeah. Uh, when I was working in video, you know, decades ago, we would just have people verbally say it on camera, turn the video on and say, hey, my name is so-and-so, it's spelled this way, and I give you permission to use these however you want. You know, work? I don't know if that would fly anymore. Um, only, only because there's like legal, there's some specific stuff that has to go in there. Um, and, but for me, I, there's, there's also apps you can use. Um, and I have a couple different apps on here that I don't, I don't, I don't know what they are right at the, right at the moment, but there's apps you can, where you can have some people sign right on the spot. They can just sign your phone, that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. There's, yeah. you know, a, a way that I often do it. I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not selling many images commercially these days. And when I, when I've done stuff in the past, it's largely editorial, but I did carry releases in the past. And what I do these days, I don't really carry them. I, I, I get people's email. And if I make a beautiful photo of someone and then I come back and I think, Ooh, that looks like it could be commercially used. You know, I'll, I'll ask them, I'll say, Hey, I'll make a print of this or I'll share, you know, the, the image with you, you know, would you mind signing this release? And then I don't usually have a problem with that. If they get something of benefit back from you, most people are more than happy to, to, um, to work with you on that. Exactly. Like that, exactly. It probably wouldn't have been in the first place. So that's yeah. for those serendipity moments, you know, um, Yep. I'm sure that the woman in uh, the Alvord loves the image you created of her and she, you know, she'd be more than happy to, to trade a big print and the ability to have that on her you know, social media for yep. release. Exactly. Yeah, no, I, um, I definitely, if it's ever going to get licensed 
I think that's maybe the way to think about it is if it's ever going to get licensed, you need to have a release. Yep. If anybody yeah. else is going to pay me, if I'm going to make money off of it, the person needs to have signed a release with me. And so sometimes I chase people down. I'm, whenever I'm in the field and I'm, and I take a picture of a stranger, I will say, Hey, I'm a portrait photographer and I'll show them my, on my phone. Hey, here's some photos that I have taken similar to this. And then I just ask, Hey, I'm, can I take your portrait? And will you give me your, you know, an email address and your Instagram handle? And that way I can always get a hold of them after the fact. Yeah, exactly. exactly. If I, if I'm not, sometimes I don't ask for the release right on the spot. Cause I just don't know if, you know, it's either awkward or I, I don't think it's a winner, you know, that's, <laughs> uh, and hey. this is one thing, this is one thing to, to, I'll just throw out there. If you, I know Hudson, I, I think you're, you have a, a pretty broad audience, but it seems like it's pretty heavy on the landscape photography, nature photography. And, yep. and I'm just going to throw something out there. You are out in the field with a super, super nice camera. And if you experience people out in the field taking selfies with their iPhone or their Android phone, why not offer to take their picture for them and give them an amazing souvenir to take home? You can get their ad oh, yeah. email address and you can send it to them after the fact. I do that all the time. And I have found so many, I've made great friends that way. And I've found clients that way too. So I do that. I do that too. It's a great exercise. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's a great way to practice being better at it too. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Uh, Knowing, knowing this group and that we're running out of time, I wanted to uh, really quickly talk about just gear kind of minimum setups and what you guys bring along essential stuff, but also your preferred setups for, you know, different situations. I'm going to kick myself off of sharing. Okay. Okay. Just so I can, I was going to say, can... there was one question I, I, we had someone ask about tripods versus handheld. And I would say, you know, some people asked about getting a subject comfortable, who's not used to being photographed. And, you know, right behind me, you can see, I got my 70 to 200. And when you're looking at me, you're actually looking at that. And I just shot a photo of the camera, you, and I do that sometimes, you know, I'll set up for someone who's really uncomfortable. If I'm doing a headshot in particular, I'll have them on a mark, maybe sitting in a chair, maybe, you know, standing in a spot that I've kind of preordained and made sure is in focus. And I can just have a conversation and get reactions. And I'm just hitting this button and my camera back there is firing, you know, having a yeah. remote shutter. That's a good way to work with someone who's uncomfortable because, you know, it's, it's much easier to be natural with that happening than, okay, you know, now put your hand, you know, that's, that's intimidating. Um, yeah. So I thought I'd just put that out there. That's a, it's one way to think about, particularly for headshot photography, you've never done it. And then I think- it's I also love more. I also love the idea of figuring out, I mean, this is kind of goofy, but it's the idea of when you tell kids to say cheese, it's because it makes them laugh because they, it seems silly. And so a lot of times when I'm doing headshots, I'll, I'll ask people, I say, okay, I know you're totally concerned about how this is going to look and exactly what kind of smile you're going to have. I want you to make the biggest, cheesiest, ridiculous little kid smile possible. And I said, I, I won't use that one. Like, you know, I said, hey, and, the, and then they kind of laugh, oh, and then they do it. And then I snap the photo right after they finish that big, goofy smile. And that way you capture a relaxed, they're laughing at themselves and they've now, they've disarmed themselves by doing that, which is kind of cool. Yeah, um, there was a couple other thoughts about posing and this is my number one thing to, to address. When you take portraits of people, don't let them look straight at the camera like this because it looks like a mugshot. You always want to think about getting at least a little bit of an angle so that you get, so even if they look straight at the camera this way, the shoulders are turned, which means the focus will fall off across their body and you'll get a little bit more, um, you can get a little bit more texture to their nose and their, and their, and their profile by doing that. Cool. We had some, some questions about what lenses are preferred, you know, a 70 to 200 and 85 really wide. You know, I, I have my absolute favorite right here. It's Nikon's kind of special 105, 1.4. Mm -hmm. It just has such a beautiful bokeh and background, but I love my 70 to 200, 28 too. What, what do you like to work with the most? So when I do headshots, it's almost always the 85 1.8 um, mm -hmm. or I'll, it kind of depends. Sometimes I'll, I'll do 24 to 70, uh, my, my 24 to 70 zoom um, at, all the way out at 70, but 85 1.8 is, is kind of my go-to when I'm doing environmental portraits though, 35. Um, I like yeah. the 35 1.4. 
Yeah. Or even sometimes a 51 eight can work great yeah. depending on this. If you need to narrow it down and you don't want as much background. I mean, it, it, it really, if you're doing environmental portraits, it's not that much different than working yeah. on the lands. When you can see, I've got my 7200 back here, but I rarely use that for portraits. Um, although in the age of COVID, maybe I should, <laughs> maybe I'll be using it more. But um, yeah, I'm kind of 85, 85 and 35 for environmental if I'm out, you know, taking pictures of somebody out in nature, um, environmental stuff. And then in the studio, it's almost always the 24 to 70 or the 85. Nice. Woody, yeah. do you want to do like a little lightning round for us quick? We'll stay just a little. Are you okay to stay just a little longer, Dan? Oh, yeah, for sure. I'll stay as long. I'm, I'm, I got an open ended uh, schedule. Well, Woody, why don't you, why don't you, uh, why don't you lead us into kind of a lightning round and, and close? This has been so much fun, Dan. I so appreciate your coming and doing yeah, this. Yeah, this has been great. Uh, there's a few about studio lighting, but we're going to kind of skip over those because we got two great uh, landscape photographers. So by just in the field lighting, um, what's the light setup you bring? And do you use LED lights or just a lot of reflectors or what? Yeah, uh, so just, I, oh, you go, go ahead, ahead, Hudson. No, you go I ahead. I was going to say okay. that I, 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 these days I, you know, I'm not doing as many portraits if i was shooting people if that was totally my focus and i'm working in bright light strobes let you get way more light intensity panel lights are great in low light dramatic light situations blue hour those kinds of scenes you can use constant light because you're not trying to to differentiate the exposure on your subject from a really bright background if you're working with bright backgrounds i mean i i in the past traveling i often carry a single really powerful strobe and an umbrella and then I have something I can use as a reflector if I need it with me. Dan? Yeah, I, so when I'm, for, for hiking, being out in the middle of nowhere purposes, uh, I have a couple of, the, of the, the loom cubes, just the actual cubes <coughs> that I bring with me just so I have something uh, in case I want to light something. And it's, they're super yeah. small and yeah, I mean, they're so, so small. If I kind of have an idea that I'm going to be doing something, then I'll bring, I have, um, I mean, this is, this is not exactly an easy thing to just add, but uh, Pro Photos B10 uh, strobe is a, is my go-to, that's my go-to lighting for pretty much all of this stuff. But that's also a, a seven, yeah, it's a $1,700 strobe. So it, it's um, big. Yeah, I mean, it's about the size huge. of, uh, it's say the size of my 24 to 70. So it's not huge. Yeah but you kind of need modifiers for it. So um, I've got a small modifier that I can bring. The other one that I really like is I do like bring panel lights and I have um, a couple different ones I really like. The first one is Roto Light makes a, a light that's called the Neo 2. And it's probably like this big. It's not that big. It's a, it's a round LED panel that is bicolor. So you can actually change the temperature from um, fairly warm, like incandescent all the way down to super cold, like 2,900. Um, right. So Rotolite Neo 2, um, it's a, it's a, just a great light and it runs on double A's, um, or you can plug it into AC power. Um, and then the other one is I actually have, I have a pair of, um, aperture, uh, Amaron lights and they're basically about the same, um, strength, but they're, they're single. They have a new version that's bicolor, but the one I, the one I have a pair of, single they're just they're not you can't change the color on them you can just change the intensity they're super bright and they run on those sony uh video camera batteries or or yeah. double a's and those are really cool and i just i keep those in my lighting bag all the time so i can just throw them up if i need to but i if i were bringing a light with me on a landscape photography outing it would probably just be one or two loom cubes with a little built-in diffuser that, that I, would probably be my go-to. I love the Loom Cube too, um, and it has the low light ability, which can be nice yep. for doing photography. But I also really like their new Pro Panel Light, the new one. Yeah. The new one can go really low intensity, and it can be controlled from the app the same way as the Loom Cube twos, and has infinite color spectrum, and even does like a fire flicker automatically, yep. where you can have this really warm light that just kind of adds into firelight photos. And what are those? They're cost, all by the way. Oh, they're expensive. They're a couple hundred bucks. They're one. Well, see, and the, the Roto light does the same thing. It's mm -hmm. it's more powerful. It doesn't have the low light, but it does all the special effects. Roto light is actually 
They are owned by Pinewood Studios in the UK, which is sort of like Lucas. It's kind of like like um, yeah. Lucas Films, uh, Industrial Light and Magic, but in the UK. So they are they make professional studio lights. Cool. I will check into for, them for movie. Yeah, it's pretty cool. I I like their stuff, and it's been fun to play with. I've, I I a lot of times have one of those in my bag, regardless of where I'm going. Great. Uh, so I'm scanning the questions here and you guys have covered a lot of ground. Uh, lenses, positioning, um, studio versus field. You've done a really, really good job. Uh, one thing I wanted to just leave with people is what would you say just a good exercise is for somebody who doesn't really do portraits to get out and try? Like what's some good, like very first steps, setups, time of day, locations, anything? Well, honestly, I mean, I think I'll, I'll let Dan talk to that, but I think the point that he made a minute ago about when you're out doing your photography, whatever, if you're an outdoor photographer, like I think most of us here in the Zoom meeting and out on YouTube are, and you run into somebody who's holding their phone up to do the selfie, offer to take their photo with your camera. You take a photo with their camera and then offer to take it with your camera and get their email. And, you know, I think that's a great way to just get started and you meet new people and yada yada but dan i'll let you jump in on the no i totally agree i, I think that's in order to get comfortable you just have you have to point your camera at people and so yeah. i i really feel like that gives you a chance to exercise your people skills <laughs> to get comfortable with the with being able to say hey i i have a camera and i know what i'm doing with it and mm -hmm. I think that that's, that's one of those things that a lot of people will be, I've had people say no, but most people are flattered. They're like, oh, oh, that would be amazing. Yeah, that would be fantastic. And you take the picture and they're blown away. And even if, even if the lighting is harsh, you and I both know, you can pull the highlight slider back a little bit if you need to, you know, to get it to, to look good. And it's way better than what they would have probably gotten with their phone. Um, yeah. I think that's the big one is to just, and, and, and maybe even to just take pictures of people that you're comfortable with. If you're going to go out hiking with somebody, um, especially if you're out on a landscape photography outing, take a picture of your, uh, of your partner that you're out there with, take a picture of them taking a picture. Maybe, maybe, so they have a new bio photo for their, you know, for, for their website or for their um, you know, social media accounts. I mean, that's a great way to get started. And you probably notice I have a lot of pictures of other photographers in my portfolio. It's because it's pretty rare that I go out with somebody that I don't ask if I could take their portrait. It's funny. I think anybody who's, and a lot of people in the, here have been on workshops with me. I'm constantly taking photos of the people in my workshops having fun, you know, and I, I get the feeling for who likes that and who doesn't like that. But I try to get a great photo of every person in my workshop and the environment that we're out in. And to me, you know, whenever I run a workshop, I've been to the place before I've photographed it. You know, I, I'm there to get other people the, the images that they want in the place. And I have fun photographing people enjoying the place and making sure that they're doing that. That's it's just so much fun. And I think, you know, another thing Dan talked about people that he's run into who are starting a business or who've written a book or who, you know, this or that or this or that. You run into people in your life, friends, acquaintances, and you think to yourself, hmm, I'll bet they could use a really good image of themselves for marketing. You know, offer to do that. If you're getting into it and you're just wanting to explore, well, you know, there's no pressure at all. You're just doing them a favor. Um, you know, don't throw yourself in a position where you're 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 doing it for money for someone to start out. Do it as a do it as a, a favor to people and get good at it that way and play yeah. around with it. And again, look at people whose work you love and think about what they did to make that image happen. Yeah. Well, and as much as I make a living make, doing headshot, you know, making headshots for people and creating new profile photos for them. The reality is if you go look at LinkedIn, most people have a photo of them at a beach party with their friend cropped out. And that's the kind of photo they're using. And if you could be out in a nice place with somebody and take a photo for them to use, like I, to me, that just seems like kind of a no brainer. It's a kind thing to do as a friend. So yep. use that as your exercise, whether you yep. want to become a professional portrait photographer, or you just want to you know what, you know what it's cool, good to be doing. It's good to be documenting your outings with your friends. And if for no other reason, you have now created one more memory and a thing that they can look back on your friendship and it's a way for you to give them something. Well put, well put.
I think we should end with that. Yeah. All right. Thanks for having me on, Hudson. This has been fun. This has been a ton of fun, and I hope everyone has enjoyed it. And uh, we're going to be back on in a couple of weeks. We'll probably, I imagine we will have Dan back on before too long, too, because that was just fun. So whenever you have time, it's great. Yeah, anytime. And Dan's got a podcast, too. I don't know if you guys all looked in the comments up near the top. You want to throw that? um, did Did we put that out at the beginning, Woody? Yeah, we'll do it again right now. He did. Right. And I'll, I'll tell you about, about it. It's called Go Take Pictures. And it's basically was an excuse during the uh, pandemic times to talk to people that I found interesting. And I reached out to some pretty amazing photographers in all disciplines. I've got portraits, uh, portrait photographers. I've got, uh, I had somebody who's a um, photojournalist. I've had a commercial photographer that shoots at, he works at Taylor Guitars in San Diego. And then I've had some amazing landscape photographers as well. So um, hopefully they're kind of fun discussions that are a little bit outside of the usual, um, the usual interview format. It's, we try to get a little bit deep. So it's, it's kind of fun. Cool. Cool. All right. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Woody. Thanks, Darren. We'll be back in a couple of weeks. We'll have a a sign up sheet up before too long. And uh, all right, everybody good times. Everybody stay safe, stay creative, and we'll see you next time.